right, welcome back everybody to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber and thanks for joining us. This is our live Q&A session right now on the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. We are in verdict watch. We are waiting to see what the jury will come back with in this monumental case of the doomsday cult mother who is facing several charges of murder and conspiracy to commit murder, all in connection with the deaths of her two children, JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, as well as the death of her current husband and co-defendant, Chad Daybell, Tammy Daybell. Now, as we wait for a verdict, we are taking your questions about this case. Anything you want to ask, now is the time to ask it. You can submit them on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, but it's not going to be me just sitting here answering your questions. There's no fun in that. So let me bring right now law and crime correspondent Gigi McKelvey, who is outside of the Ada County Courthouse in Boise, Idaho. And I'm also joined by law and crime's very own Terry Austin to talk about this. Gigi, I'll start with you. What a day. So closing arguments have wrapped up. I'm first going to start with my own question. Anything you're reading about when the jury might come back, any, how long have they been deliberating? Do we have any sense of even how long they might go tonight? Yes, we have a little bit of insight. They started deliberating, I think about 2.18 is when, or 2.13 is when they got the case. And normally we end our days at 3.30 here, but the jury has decided to go later tonight. And I've heard a mention of supper being brought in, been told that they are motivated. So it's quite possible, you know, we could go later into the evening and maybe have a verdict. I think that after six weeks of sitting in, hearing this evidence, uh, you know, it's just going to be a matter of uh, taking a vote and seeing if everybody He's on board and and looking through some things, but I think I think this is gonna be a quick one, Jesse. All right, who's ready to take some questions? I am. I am Terry. I'm gonna go with you. Danielle Peck from Facebook asks: Though the defense called no witnesses to the stand and Vallow herself didn't testify, they claim that the prosecution didn't make their case. Is there actually a chance that Lori Vallow Daybell could be found not guilty, Terry? There is a chance, but I think it's a slim chance. And I think one of the problems, and he pointed it out in the question, is they did not bring any witnesses. They could have brought some experts on the case. They could have definitely had someone to refute what others were saying, all of the friends and family who testified. They could have had other people who said that she's a good person and she wasn't like this before she met Chad. But instead, they simply cross-examined and they didn't put witnesses and she didn't testify. So I think the likelihood that she gets off is very low. I think there's a greater likelihood that she will be convicted, frankly, of all charges. Okay. I know there's been some debate about whether or not she's actually going to be convicted with respect to the conspiracy charge to Tammy Daybell. Did the prosecution prove beyond Beyond a reasonable doubt that she plotted to kill this woman that we can have a whole conversation on GG I have a question that's specific to you this is from Teresa and Bobby Albertson from Facebook and by the way just want to thank everybody for submitting your questions on here because we really do appreciate it and we hope to give you the best answers that we can so Teresa and Bobby Albertson ask Gigi do you sit and wait at the courthouse for the verdict I heard it's first come first serve uh, thank you uh, for all the hard work you do bringing us this information well, thank you guys. I appreciate that. Right now, the courtroom is about three quarters of the way full. So those of us that have tickets, we can go back up tonight. Tomorrow, it's a free for all. We all laugh about we're going to trip people up when verdicts announced to get in that courtroom because once that courtroom hits capacity, they're shutting the doors and then we all run down to the overflow room. But it's, you know, the one thing to consider is that verdict is live stream. So people aren't going to break their backs to get here when they can watch it from the comfort of their own home. And uh, yeah, so there's just so much anticipation around here right now. Um, I think a little relief. Uh, one little fun fact, Larry Woodcock is up there in the courtroom right now with his iPad playing JJ's favorite songs, uh, We Will Rock You by Queen and Thunderstruck mm. by ACDC. And he's smiling, you know, just a relief that at least this part's over and now we wait. So it's nice to see Larry a little lighthearted and enjoying some sweet memories of JJ. Um, Gigi, I want to stick with you for a second because this is an interesting question, something that I addressed earlier on in the week. This is from at NLB3121 from Twitter. Is it 100% certain that Alex Cox died of natural causes? Has there been any talk about reviewing his death, which I think is such an interesting question, considering the evidence has suggested he is the person that carried out the killings. There is even evidence that he predicted he was going to die. He said that he was the fall guy. That's according to Zulema Pastenas, his widow. Um, and then he suddenly dies. We thought it was from blood clots. We, you know, Tammy Daybell, at one point in time, we thought she died of natural causes. 
Her body was exhumed. Now we learn that she died from asphyxiation at the hands of another. Chad Daybell is charged with her actual murder. So what do you think, Gigi? Any talks about looking a little bit further into the death of Alex Cox? Well, that ship has sailed, Jesse. It was ruled natural. The FBI was in attendance because the day he dropped over dead, they were actually having an all-agency meeting about this very case. Now, the FBI did attend his autopsy. It was deemed natural, and he was cremated. So I don't think there's any chance of, of that being overturned, but I will die on the hill that that man did not just happen to drop over dead the day after they exhumed Tammy Daybell's body. I don't know what he did, but apparently it wasn't easy to detect. I don't blame you for that thinking, considering everyone died under very mysterious circumstances and very convenient time. I don't say that. I say that in terms of what did we hear during the course of this case. If you believe the prosecution's narrative that Chad and, and, and Lori wanted these people dead, they died like right after. They died according to their timeline. Now, um, this is a great question, Terry, something that I have theorized as well. At TurnKim31818 from Twitter, do you think that Lori has been trying to protect Chad, which is why no defense? I think my opinion is that my opinion is that she might have told her attorneys, listen, do what you need to do to fight my case to say the prosecution hasn't met their burden, but don't throw Chad under the bus. Don't throw Alex Cox under the bus. He's still the love of my life. I don't want to jeopardize his case. What do you think, Terry? I don't think that so much. I mean, we didn't see any evidence during the trial, but during the closings, there was some pointing of the finger to take it away from Lori. I think that her defense team simply didn't obviously want to put her on the stand, and they probably didn't have much evidence to put on independently. They just cross-examined. I don't think the theory was, let's protect Chad necessarily. I think they were trying to protect Lori, and I do think they pointed the finger, and they did leave it up in the air. It was probably Chad and probably Alex. Lori wasn't there. She was away. She wasn't at the you know scene of the crime. So I, I don't think she's trying to protect him. I think she's just trying to protect herself. Let, let's amplify that a little bit, Gigi, because I want to throw it to you. During the closing arguments from the defense, did they throw Chad under the bus at all, or, or where did they go when they were describing him? Yeah, they threw him under the bus for sure, and I've heard rumors Lori was none too happy about that, by the way. Mm. Uh, that was something she did not want, was to throw Chad under the bus from what I'm hearing. But what do you do? You're trying to, to, to do the best job for your client. She really doesn't have much of a defense. All of her text messages and this body cam video works against her so, so bad. All you can do is say, hey, before Chad, she was a great mom. We never had any problems. You look deeper into her life. She wasn't always a great mom. There's, there's been issues since Tyler was a very little girl, but her kids were alive up until 2019, just a, a little, little before a year after she had met Chad, met Chad Daybell, everybody was dead. Let's go to at Anna Mabel Q from Twitter. Uh, can there be a partial guilty verdict, Terry, i.e., can Lori Vallow Daybell be found guilty only of the children's murders but not Tammy's? You know the answer to this one. Absolutely, yes. And we could very well get a split verdict like that. Each and every count is determined separately by that jury. And if they have a verdict on each of the different counts and they don't have a verdict as it relates to Tammy, then we could come back with guilty for conspiracy and murder as far as the children are concerned. And we could see a not guilty as far as Tammy. That is by far the more difficult case. And sometimes when we see that, that split verdict, that gives you an insight that this is a jury that carefully paid attention to the evidence. They didn't just throw a brush and say guilty or not guilty across the board. When we see those split verdicts, to me, it signifies not that a jury that would find some Lori Valadebo guilty across the board is not carefully considering the evidence. But when you see that split verdict, those are, those are jurors who are really looking at this and saying the prosecution met their burden here, but not here. They carefully evaluated each piece of evidence. Uh, Gigi, Heather Strock from YouTube asks, where is Lori being held during these deliberations? Actually, we haven't heard. They do have a holding cell here in the courthouse, and then, you know, it's not too far from the jail. But I would imagine while they're deliberating, maybe they keep her here. It's easier to keep her in one spot. I'm going to try to find that out for you guys. But um, she is not in the courtroom right now. Her defense attorneys are. The prosecution is not. Let me ask you one more uh, question here, Gigi. This is from at Cowgirl Lamb from Twitter. 
How, and if you know this, how soon is someone sentenced in Idaho if found guilty? So presuming, let's say uh, Lori Valdebel is convicted today, do we know when her sentencing would be? I've heard a couple of different options. I've heard no less or um, no less than two, no more than 45 days. But I've also heard that it could be uh, late summer um, just because there's like a pre-sentencing investigation that they may do. Um, so those are the two things. We, we haven't got a clear answer on sentencing, but it seems like, too, it will be in Fremont County. Yeah. When she is sentenced, it will not be here in Boise. And she would face, you know, life in prison um, if she's ultimately convicted. Right. Um, life without parole. Life without parole. That's correct. All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get more of your questions. Keep throwing them at us. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. We'll do our best to answer them here on the air. So any question you have, any comment you have about the Lori Vallow Daybell case, now is the time to ask. We'll be right back right after this. More. Hey, Brian. Five minutes to hook myself up, and we only have four. And you're waiting for the verdict?
Welcome back to Law & Crime, everybody. So we are awaiting a verdict in the Doomsday Cult Mom murder trial out of Boise, Idaho. The 49-year-old woman accused of killing her two youngest children as well as her husband's first wife. I have an excellent legal panel here with me to answer any of your questions. That's right, this is our live Q&A session. So send all of your questions to us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. We'll try our best to get to, of many of, to as many of them as possible. Now, before we even get to your questions, I do want to listen to some sound that I think the jury might be interested in revisiting during their deliberations and that is the phone call that Lori's former friend Melanie Gibb recorded with the defendant and her husband. Take a listen. I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if, um, if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was and he said I did not want to know and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know why he would say that, but it's the same story. Like I, yeah. I, I, I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know, so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it, so he can be safe. Yeah. So, are you? I mean, are you? How, how long are you gonna be away for? Like, how? I mean, are you ever gonna be able to come out and? come back to society again or are you gonna keep you know like come back I mean like what does that look like I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day so okay. I just wondered if I was ever gonna see you again absolutely you will okay so yep. so maybe when they're done chasing you you'll be able to come out of you'll be able to come out again or yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's gone on that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're working with her in some dark capacity. The police are working with her in some dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me uh -huh. in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, has she, has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Okay, I'm back here with Long Crime's Terry Austin and Long Crime correspondent Gigi McKelvey, who's outside the Ada County Courthouse in Boise, Idaho, eagerly anticipating a verdict. And I believe we said that there'd be an hour between the announcement of the verdict and when it's ultimately read. Um, Gigi, we got an interesting question. Um, the, uh, this is, uh, let me just pull up the name real quick. This is Neener Bananas from YouTube. What is Lori's demeanor in court? It was a little bit all over the place today. There were times she got emotional uh, early this morning when they were talking about Colby, her oldest and only surviving child now. She started crying. Uh, other people who sat on that side said there were times she did get emotional. I actually saw her personally wipe her eyes and have a little bit of a red nose when Rob Wood was doing the rebuttal. So that was interesting. There wasn't really anything graphic put up on the screen, but maybe just reality that this is it. This is her, her fate is now in this jury's hands and Lori's always wiggled out of it, but not so much this one. And I think maybe that's probably the emotion with her more than anything, because we've never shown her really seen her really show any emotion in regards to graphic photos of the kids on the screen or anything like that. And by the way, since this is going to be a live streamed verdict, presumably we are going to see the reaction from Lori Vallow Daybell as this verdict is ultimately handed down. Terry, I want to ask you something about the recording that we just listened to. That is one of several recordings in this case. There was the recording between Chad and Lori when they were searching Chad's house. She didn't seem too surprised. There was the recording between her and Colby Ryan, her son, the recording between her and her sister, Summer Shiflet, where they're begging for answers as to why these kids died. And Lori is just not giving them responses. She's basically saying, you don't understand what happened. One day the truth will come out. I feel those recordings, those words of Lori Valadebel, coupled with the text message conversations between her and Chad, are some of the worst evidence against her. Would you agree with me on that? I agree wholeheartedly, no doubt about it. Listen, Melanie Gibb was supposed to be her best friend at the time, and they confided in each other. And at some point, Melanie decided, look, something is not right here. She is not talking about the children. And she was cooperating, really, at that time, getting these recordings in. And she's trying to find more information. What is it that you know, Lori? 
Why aren't you talking to us? They are investigating the disappearance of your children. You should be helping them. If you know anything, please tell them. And as you heard on that recording, Lori was not forthright. She just said basically that this is what is supposed to be happening, that all is well. And that is, I think, something that the jury is going to think about as far as how could any mother, knowing that their children are missing, not respond and try to help the authorities to locate those children. So, Gigi, I think it's really interesting that there's been so much discussion in this case about the death percentages of the kids and how they were rated and whether or not they had demons in them or dark spirits. This is a good question from Smoky Cat, Kathy from YouTube. Did Chad or Lori ever rate Chad's kids as being evil or good? Not that we know of. Um, I mean, I mean, it seems like they were spared from it all. The only thing I've heard negative in regards to Chad's kids was kind of towards the end of the trial where a couple of his kids expressed concern that he wanted nothing to do with them. And his son, Garth, said, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my dad, too. So maybe he was distancing himself. But as far as raiding his kids, never heard it. All five are alive and well. So uh, very much unlike, unfortunately, Lori Vallow's kids and Chad's wife and Charles Vallow. You wonder again if it's a situation where the as the prosecution believe it was it was the kids, it was Charles Vallow, it was Tammy Dable who were directly in the way of these two getting together and starting a life. That's something to think about. All right, Terry, I'm going to throw two questions to you. They're basically the same thing, but I want to give each of our viewers an ample opportunity uh, for their question to be heard. This is from Julio from YouTube. Will Chad Daybell accept a plea deal if Lori is found guilty? And AG from YouTube says, do you think Chad will make a plea deal? What do you think? I think probably yes. There could be a plea deal, particularly if she's found guilty. He has, through his attorneys, seen all of the evidence that has been put forth in that case. And some of that evidence really is damaging as far as he is concerned. And if she's found guilty, particularly of all charges, and particularly as it relates to Tammy, I think he will be incentivized to try to take a plea deal. And I don't think he's going to get much. Obviously, he could right now face the death penalty because they haven't taken that off the table That's right. for him. And so I think the greatest deal he could get is prison for life and not get the death penalty. And I think if she's convicted on all counts, yeah, we'll probably see a plea deal. Uh, a lot of questions about Lori's mental health, Gigi. Donna from YouTube, did Lori get a diagnosis from a psych evaluation? Is she on any meds? Well, we do know that Jim Archibald in some pretrial motions had said that we will learn her diagnosis at trial. However, Lori did not want mental health to come in, so ultimately we did not learn that. I know there was an order for her to be forced medicated if needed, so I assume she's on medication for whatever she was diagnosed with. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of bizarre that mental health wouldn't come in. It would have been really the only defense they had other than throwing Chad under the bus at the last minute, as well as Alex a little bit, too mainly Chad though but yeah it's clear you know the one thing we've all consistently said is her reaction in that courtroom is just not appropriate for why we're here um, you know she can go from looking sad and wiping her eyes to 20 seconds later she's kind of giggling and tilting yeah. her head back and you know with her attorney so it's all over the map um, you know I have no doubt that there is something there with her however the lies we have on body cam the text messages if just because you have mental illness does not make you uh, not culpable. And I think that that's going to be maybe that's why they didn't bring it in, because really, you, Lori will be her own undoing. I agree with what she said earlier. The videotapes, the body cam video, the text messages, that's going to be what sinks her. And and it's going to be from her own doings. Yeah, well, look, there's no insanity defense in Idaho. If there was, this would have been a different case. Nope. Um, Terry, we've got about a minute left. Let me ask you real quick. The irrational thinker from YouTube on this theory, do you think that the lack of remorse shown by Lori will sway the jury, especially when pictures of her children were shown? Absolutely. I think that jury is going to be swayed by sympathy. They understand that these are lives of innocent people who have been taken, particularly those children, and knowing what they had to go through and the brutality 
reality of the deaths. I think regardless of the evidence, and obviously there was a ton of evidence put in, 60 witnesses, but I think no matter what, they're going to have sympathy for those victims, and I think they'll probably come back with a verdict against Lori on all counts. All right, well, these are fantastic questions. Uh, we're gonna take more of them. We still have another half hour or so to go uh, with our live Q&A session, so please keep these questions coming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We will do our best to answer them. And of course, we're in Verdict Watch, waiting to see what happens in the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back right after this.
back to now the second half of our live Q&A here at Law and Crime, everybody. As you know, this is the verdict watch in the doomsday cult mom murder trial that we've been following here on the network. 49-year-old Lori Vallow Daybell is facing charges for the deaths of her 7-year-old son, J.J. Vallow, her 16-year-old daughter, Tylee Ryan, and she is also charged in connection to the death of her husband's first wife, 49-year-old Tammy Daybell. And as we wait for the verdict... And of course, if we hear anything, we will let you know. I want to take a look at some of the most important sound that the jury heard in this trial this week, some of which they might ask to listen to again as they deliberate. So before we get into your questions, and again, submit your questions during this live Q&A on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We'll do our best to read them here on the air. We want to start with this jailhouse call between defendant Lori Vallow Daybell and her husband, Chad Daybell. This was the day that the police were searching Chad's property and found the kids buried in the backyard. Take a listen. This is a call from and paid for by Lori. An inmate at Madison County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. Thank you for using Tellmate. talk about this. So joining Terry Austin and me this hour is Law and Crime Executive Producer Kathy Russin, who is also live in Ada County, outside the Ada County Courthouse in Boise, Idaho. Kathy, good to see you. That recording between Chad and Lori, my understanding, played a significant role in the closing arguments today, right? Very interesting. Both Rob Wood, the prosecutor, and Jim Altrabal, the defense attorney, told the jury to listen to that. They both think that that call helps each of their cases. Rob Wood says in that call, so we, what we know about this is Lori's already been by, behind bars for months. Chad has not. 
and that's in June of 2020, and they're digging up his backyard, and he's sitting in his car on the corner watching it happen, and she happens to call from jail. What I do know is that Chad and Lori talk to each other every single day from the time that she was put in jail. They were in-person visits every day until the pandemic hit in March, and then they were vid video visits every single day. So that was her real only big contact outside of jail was Chad. So she just called. And he's just like, so they're searching here. And she says, oh, really? The house? So Rob Wood says, listen to that. And you will hear in Lori's voice, guilt and fear. Because mm. she knew her kids are being dug up. Jim Archibald gets up there and says, listen to that recording. And you will hear that she has no idea that they're about to find her kids. She has no idea her kids are in that backyard. So I believe the jury's listening to that call, probably right now. Yeah, it's so curious because where is the, why are they searching your backyard, Chad? What on earth is happening? We don't really hear that. Kathy, I want to actually hit you with two questions. Um, very similar to what we just talked about. This is from Donna Heber from YouTube. Are Chad and Lori still in contact with each other? And this is from at BWV58 from Twitter. Have Chad and Lori had contact since their arrests? And will they be able to if they're both convicted? And no, they. I don't believe they've had any contact since Chad's arrest, which was that day. And if you listen to the end of that call, she says, can I call you later? And he says, I'll answer if I can. He yeah. knew exactly what was about to be found in his backyard. Um, so no, they have not had any contact except for the couple of times they've been in the courtroom together. And remember, that stopped because she was found incompetent for a while. And then uh, this last time they were both there at the same time, reporters said she looked at him a lot and he didn't look at her. So I don't know really what that means, but uh, no. And then once they're both, con if they're both convicted and they're at separate prisons, I don't know why they can't send letters to each other or whatever, they will all be read. Yeah, uh, uh, look, so Terry, one of the interesting things we talked about uh, with Gigi and I kind of want to bring up again is if this was a case in a state where the uh, insanity defense was on the table, I think we'd have a completely different discussion about this, about whether or not she'd be found guilty or not guilty by reason of insanity. The reason I ask you that is we have a question from Shirley AC12 from YouTube. Do you think Lori's a psychopath because of her lack of emotion and her giggling while being interviewed? I think that's an interesting question because if this was an insanity case, do you think she might be found not guilty by reason of insanity, Terry? Well, it's not an insanity case, but I do think she has some personality disorders, but. The question is, did she know the difference between right and wrong? Did she have the mens rea, the intent to commit this crime, regardless of what her mental abilities or disabilities might have been? And I think the jury, even if this had been an insanity case, I think the jury would determine, just based on all of her actions, the fact that, you know, she's looking at rings before Tammy's even dead. She's in Hawaii when the children have disappeared. I mean, there's so much that happened in terms of consciousness of guilt. I do think that that jury would look at everything and all of the evidence and determine, regardless of her mental state, she knew what she was doing, she had that intent, and she meant to kill the people who died. All right, Kathy, let's do a little bit of um, predicting, if we can. This is from at Becca Foot on Twitter. Do you think since the jury are staying late and determined that a verdict is possible today? I do think it's possible today. As we all know, we can't predict a jury, so I, I can say that. I can say that from a semi-educated uh, stance of just covering hundreds of trials. Um, but remember, seven-week trial, there's seven counts, and this is a lot. This jury knew very little about this case coming in. Can you imagine when they first got back in that jury room today? Do you think the first thing they did is look at each other and say, zombies, what? Because mm. they, they, they didn't know anything. Also, in Rob Wood's opening statement, he never brought up religion at all, period. So they started hearing that come out in witness testimony. So I think they have a lot to talk about. But you know, things, you never know, it could go both ways. They could get in there and go, it's over. And they just go mark their verdict for him and, and be done. So I don't know, I think they have to talk a lot about Tammy's count personally. I think the prosecution probably has gotten there, but there's a lot to talk about. 
on if they really did get there with her conspiring. Right. The thing with the prosecution is they had so many texts that night of Tammy's death, but they don't have the actual texts. They only oh. know Chad and Lori text back and forth. Alex and Chad text back. They don't have the actual words. That could have been the smoking gun for Tammy, but they don't have that. So they may want to talk about Tammy for a while. And there's multiple charges. They have to really carefully look at the language. It can get a bit complicated, particularly when you even talk about first degree murder, because it doesn't necessarily mean that Lori had to kill the kids, but if she encouraged or aided in some way, and they're gonna have to debate that. Now, Kathy, I just wanna stick with you for a second because we have a question from Tear L from YouTube. How much time will the judge give everyone to get back to the courthouse? Um, so I'll ask you that, but also what's the scene like right now? Um, so one hour is the is the timing. Uh, I don't think that'll be that way for questions. So we are just all camped out inside the courtroom. That's why Gigi and I took turns coming down here so we can save a spot up there. And it's kind of a, very informal inside the courtroom, mostly just media, some spectators, and the rules are all relaxed now. So that's why Larry was playing uh, We Will Rock You inside the courtroom a little while ago. Uh, but, so, but for the verdict, they set a one hour notice. And they had not said that they will have a cutoff time tonight. Yep. So we don't know. We, we don't know. We could be here all night. The scene, the scene is, this morning was crazier than it is right now. There's not much going on out here outside except media. And I'd say in the courtroom or in the halls, there's probably maybe 40 spectators outside of all the media. Mm. Uh, so it, this morning, though, I had never seen that. When I walked, when I parked and then came around the corner, I was like, whoa, there was a huge line to get in the courthouse, and I hadn't experienced that yet. Welcome to the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. That was what that was like. Uh, <laughs> you so have. that was a sampling of it. Yeah. Um, all right, Terry, this is a great question. This is from at Bobby O'Law from Twitter. State's evidence indicated that Melanie and Zulema, Melanie Gibbs, Zulema Pastenis, were involved in the castings of the deceased and that they also had knowledge of death percentages. Can they be charged with conspiracy, obstruction, or something? Do we know who got immunity? Well, they could be charged, but I don't think they will be charged. I don't think there's enough evidence to say that they actually knew that these deaths were going to be carried out. They participated in the castings, as did many other women and other people, but they didn't think that they were trying to kill people or that Lori and Chad would be trying to kill people. They, I think, based on what we've heard, they thought that they were casting out these dark spirits and they were doing what their religion told them to do. I don't think that they actually thought that anyone was going to die as a result of it. So I don't think that charges could be brought either against Melanie or Zulima because there's not enough evidence. They want to make sure if they bring charges that they can win on those charges. Kathy, this is a question we've and been getting. I, yeah, yeah, sorry, Kathy, that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Melanie, Melanie Gibb, yeah, but Melanie Pulowski is more involved than even Melanie Gibb because Melanie Pulowski believed her children were dark. Yes. So she was all in it. The text messages were like, you think all the children will go? You know, like that. Yeah. So, and then she didn't end up testifying. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's obviously crazy stuff, but like Terry said, also to answer that, I don't think any immunity deals have been given out. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so either. Um, Kathy, we have a question from Lauren Caldwell from YouTube. Why is Lori not getting the death penalty? Because there was some, uh, 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 my understanding was a procedural mistake was made um, that might have impacted it. Um, well, the argument from her attorneys were a lot of things. They actually mentioned her mental health problem. They said, we don't kill people in this country that have mental health issues. That was one of their arguments. Then um, d a piece of DNA was, wasn't tested and it was found late. This is why Chad's case got severed. Yep. Um, and the judge would have delayed Lori's and kept them together, but Lori would not, re would not waive her right to speedy trial. And Chad did. So I think it was easier for them to do, grant the defense motion to take death off the table. She, look, she has some issues. So as much as people don't want to think, there is definitely some mental health on board with her. And I'm sitting in that court and with her, and she's not right. Yeah. So um, I don't know that death would be appropriate anyway, even though, we, you know, dead, her children are dead and people want that. When you look at it legally, I think in the end the judge was just like, we'll take that off. That's a whole separate moral legal question we could get into. I don't think we have enough time uh, about that uh, in terms of whether or not
somebody who's mentally ill in that capacity should be executed. I think we can get to one more question. Um, let's get to one more question. Retha McLam from Facebook. I'll, and I'll throw this to you, um, Kathy. Why wasn't Lori charged with conspiracy in Charles, Charles Vallow's death? And why, wait, oh, sorry. Yeah, this is a mistake, though, because she was charged with conspiracy to commit the murder of Charles Vallow. So that's my, yep. that's my answer to this question. Yep. But the next one is, why was the death penalty? <laughs> sorry, you know what? This is, you just answered it. It's the same question. Why was the death penalty taken off the table? You just answered it. No problem. Um, and yes, she is separately charged with respect to Charles Vallow out in Arizona, conspiracy to commit his murder. Uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, we have more questions coming in. Keep them coming in. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Kathy, me, Terry, we'll do our best to answer them here on the air. And of course, we are in Verdict Watch in the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. We'll be back. <laughs>
Welcome back to our live Q&A session here on Law and Crime, everybody, as we await the verdict in the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. I'm here once again with Kathy Russin and Terry Austin uh, talking about this case and also breaking down your questions. Keep them coming in on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We'll do our best to answer them here on the air. Kathy, I want to go to you. Uh, this is from at AMJ301 from Twitter. What was Lori's reaction to her lawyer blaming Chad, which we kind of, you know, was an interesting kind of about face. They kind of didn't speak too highly of him. What was her reaction during uh, Mr. Archibald's closing argument? That was the most interesting. So first during Rob Wood, she did a lot of shaking her head when he would say things about wanting her children dead. And then she'd write stuff and then she'd make Archibald look at it. And she was very animated during Rob's. During Archibald, she was still and she looked very tense. And I do not think that she knew that he was going to do what he did, which is what he said was, Lori is gullible, or he's stupid, whatever, followed this, followed this guy in his crappy books, and, uh, and she fell under the spell of this guy. You know, and then in, to dispute the prosecution's theory of Lori just wanted sex, money, and power, he said, uh, look, have you seen a picture of Charles Vallow, and have you seen a picture of Chad Daybell? I don't think she was choosing him for sex. And it was like that. She was not happy, not mm -hmm. happy at all with his closing. She does not want to throw Chad under the bus or Alex under the bus. I don't know what she wants. I don't know what she wants her defense to do. Um, but he he got up there and said, do you, how do you know that Lori knew her kids were dead? Did the prosecution ever show you anything that she knew her kids were dead? All they ever showed you was she knew her. She knew J.J. was safe. So it was it was a very interesting closing argument. But for me, she was completely tense and, and started to get a little red face. I'm, I have a kind of a side view of her, but I'm very close. I was just on the second row um, and she was she was not happy with that at all. I could tell. Which is so interesting, because if we talk about does she really understand? Well, I mean, she's competent to stand trial, but, you know, does she understand the nature of the showing no kind of emotion? She seemed to show emotion when it came to Chad, so that's pretty interesting to think about. All right, Terry, I got a question for you. This is from Ava Smith from YouTube. Let's talk about uh, Lori Vallow Daybell's defense. Why didn't her defense go the brainwa brainwashing route? Since religion played into the relationship, and I use that term loosely, why no brainwashing defense? I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> Maybe they didn't think of it. And as we talk more about Lori, and Kathy mentioned the fact that she was upset when Archibald was talking about, you know, look at Chad compared to Charles, and what did Lori know? She was just being led on. I do think since she was very upset about those issues that maybe it was she who didn't want to seem as though she were brainwashed. I think she controlled much of that defense, not talking anything about any mental issues, obviously no insanity defense, but not talking about mental issues, not talking about Chad and talking about Alex. I definitely think that she limited her defense, and that could, at the end of the day, have hurt her. Now, you know, on appeal, maybe she could talk about the incompetency of her attorneys, but I think that's going to be a difficult task for her to try to prove that that happened. But yeah, I, I definitely think that coercion or, you know, persuasion or some sort of brainwashing could have been some issue that could have been raised that might have helped her defense. All right. Well, again, maybe she I can, didn't, I can did, add to that. Yeah, Kathy, add to it, because I think she wouldn't want to let me, make let me Chad add to look that. negative. Yeah. I hear uh, that she would not allow her attorneys to bring up anything in mental health. We know that because that has been said in court, but that she would not cooperate in throwing Chad or Alex under the bus. Yep. She doesn't want any part of that at all. And their hands were tied. So I don't think they could have brought on a brainwashing expert or whatever, but that's what he did in closing. In cl his whole closing was she was under Chad's spell. That he, This guy found her at a vulnerable time in her life, and, and she believed she was duped by him. And he said she, he told her she was a goddess and she was going to lead 144,000 people, and she, he just raised her up. And how many followers did she get to the religion? He said zero. He said Chad got about six, which is interesting because the only people were the people in Lori's life. Zulema, Melanie, Melanie, Audrey, right? But he, ca he called them Chad's followers and that Lori failed. She couldn't even get one person to follow her. So he really did do that in his closing.
for the most part. Yeah, a little bit of a bowed face. All right, so I'm going to answer the last question. Um, it's Medak from YouTube. How can we get alerted when a verdict is reached? By following us here on Law & Crime and our Twitter page. You're going to get an hour's advance notice. We will bring that verdict to you live. And, of course, we will do extended coverage and analysis of it as well. Kathy, thank you so much. Great reporting from out there. And I know you're going to be eagerly anticipating a verdict. Terry, thank you so much for taking the time to break down all these questions. And everyone out there, thank you so much for submitting your questions here on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. It's always a pleasure to do that for you. That's uh, all we have for you right now, but stay tuned to Law & Crime, because as I said, we will bring you the verdict live later tonight if that does come in. I'm Jesse Weber. We'll see you in a little bit.